like to thank Patrick for giving me the opportunity to present today. Um, I think uh, it's a great opportunity to kind of show what I've been working on as well. Um, but let me quickly introduce myself. My name is Danny Zapata. I uh, graduated from Cal Poly uh, with the Power Systems uh, Electrical Engineering degree. And after uh, graduation, I was um, recruited by Valero Gas Refinery in Benicia. And I work as the electrical engineer there for the INE department there. Um, I've also worked at San Diego Gas and Electric Utility uh, down in Southern California, and I'm very heavily involved in the Industrial Application Society and also serve on the committee for the Petrochemical uh, Industry Conference that they hold every year. Um, I've also am the co-founder of Rotor Optics, which is a small group of engineers with a common interest in um, small unmanned aerial system applications within specific industry. So going to my presentation, what I've titled is Small Unmanned Aerial Safe System Safety Consideration in the Petrochemical Industry. Now the objection of my presentation is to basically share some potential hazards and safety considerations that we should consider when we're operating unmanned aerial systems within hazardous locations like the oil and gas industry. I will begin on briefly showing how these new standards and regulations will be considered to be a foundation for other industries to build upon on. And then the heart of my presentation will discuss uh, hazardous materials, hazardous locations, electromagnetic interference. Um, and then I'll conclude my presentation by showing a couple practices and asking a couple questions that we should ask ourselves when we're developing a program in hazardous, hazardous locations like such. Now it's no secret that there's a great push for unmanned aerial systems to be integrated to the national airspace. It's basically it's gonna unlock potentials and some benefits and create jobs and boost the economy and also further advance the innovation and technology within the United States. Um, as the FAA integrates these small unmanned aerial systems, their main concern is any avoidance or any collisions within other manned aircrafts and any damage within equipment or hurting, damaging people on the ground. Now, as the FAA integrates this, they're not responsible for safety issues considering to certain applications. So what I predict is that the FAA's new rules and regulation would be considered as a base and foundation for other industries to develop and grow or build their potential or their um, drone standards and in industries. Um, so for example, the, uh, there'll be drone regulations and standards developed in specific industries like the electrical utility, emergency response, and the petrochemical, oil and gas industries. And any other industries that develop drone programs will basically build on top of the FAA rules and regulations. Now with my interest in small unmanned aerial systems and my background in the oil and gas industry, I hope to pave the wave of developing new standards for small unmanned aerial system applications within the petrochemical industry. So the benefits of using unmanned aerial systems in, in the oil and gas allows to complete difficult tasks without risking any personnel, making a much productive and much more cost effective um, solution. Now I could have present on various applications using these unmanned aerial systems in the petrochemical industries, but I felt like I felt like there might have been information already out there that exists. So I kind of wanted to take it a little bit step further and discuss the discuss the uh, considerations and, and discuss the um, accidents, if, if there is any accidents within the petrochemical industry. So I asked myself, can these drones potentially cause an incident or an accident that can endanger people, equipment, or cause an environmental impact? With that being asked, I believe when we're developing drone programs in hazardous locations like such, we should define the, the risks and mitigate them and develop a safe program when we're actually using these potential um, aircrafts in the industry. So what I do is I attempt to break these into three sections or safety considerations into three sections. I'll, con I'll discuss a little bit about the hazardous material, discuss a some information about hazardous location and talk about electromagnetic interference that we should consider in the oil and gas industry. Now in the oil and gas industry, the most common concern is the mixtures of these, of these components here. 
If you mix fuel with an oxidizing agent, mostly common oxygen, and find a potential source, it may result into a fire and an explosion. Now these are the three elements of a fire triangle and when simultaneously presented and in certain quantities, they could cause a fire and an explosion. Now in this presentation, I don't specify the actual hazardous material. Instead, I'll specify some common characteristics within certain materials. So I'll explain flammable and combustible liquids and vapor, which is the first element of the fire triangle fuel. And then I'll discuss about the vapor concentration in air, which is the second element of the fire triangle, oxygen. And then I'll list a couple examples of common ignition sources, which is our final element of the fire triangle. Now when I discuss about flammable and combustible liquids, these liquids are easily ignited with explosive forces. Now, the thing that I want you guys to take away from this is the flashpoint. I'm gonna discuss a little bit about the flashpoint because it indicates the danger that's posed within or with a fire hazard. Now, the flashpoint of a flammable and combustible liquid is the minimum temperature that is required for it to begin to establish these vapors to form an ignitable mixture within the air. So the example that I have up here is a flammable liquid with the flash point of 77 degree Fahrenheit. Once, it's temp once the liquid starts to increase in temperature and surpasses the flash point, it begins to produce a vapor that forms within, within the air and, it, and, and it's basically ignitable mixture. Now the difference between a flammable liquid and a combustible liquid is identified by the flash point temperature. Anything under 100 degrees is considered to be a flammable liquid, and then anything above the 100 degree mark will be considered to be a combustible liquid. Now these flammable and combustible liquids can actually be subdivided into different categories, category ones, two, three, and four and it's identified by the flash point on the y-axis and the boiling point on the x-axis. This is beyond the scope of the actual presentation, but I felt like it was worth mentioning. Now, as I discussed the first element of the fire triangle, which was fuel in the forms of flammable and combustible liquids, I now go on and talk about the second element, which is the oxidizing agent. And I explain this by using this graph. This is the percent fuel in air from the left at 0% and it gradually increases to 100%. Now each gas vapor has a lower explosive limit and an upper explosive limit, which is identified as LEL and UEL. Now this is the lowest concentration percentage for a gas vapor in air to be capable of producing a flash fire. Between these ranges are the flammable range. Now I'll demonstrate a flammable liquid which is below its LEL limit. Now once this, uh, this liquid reaches its flash point, it begins to produce the vapor. This vapor mixes with air, and if the concentration is actually below that LEL, it is too lean to produce, produce a fire and will not ignite. Now on the other side of the LEL is gonna be UEL. There's a liquid there, it achieves the flash point, it produces vapor, and this is gonna be too rich if it's above its UEL. So this liquid, or this fume, I should say, will not ignite. Now, if we have that same liquid that produces the vapor and mixes in between the air, between the actual flammable range, this gas vapor is now capable of producing a vapor that can ignite, and this vapor will ignite and cause a flash of fire. Now, going into the final element of the fire triangle that we discussed, is ignition sources. So I listed a couple examples of ignition sources that can be found in the refinery. Now, as we start implementing these unmanned aerial systems into the national airspace, there's gonna be more and more applications that can be used in various industries like the oil and gas industry. So now we start introducing a new ignition source to the oil and gas industry. Now, these unmanned aircraft systems contain various mechanical and electrical components that can malfunction or overheat. The examples I give is striped wire, a short circuit, an aircraft collision, or overheated ESC. Now this scenario that I present will kind of show my concern about operating these unmanned aerial systems in hazardous location. I demonstrate 
a part of a chemical process unit where identified division one locations. This means that there's a potential source of ignition, gases that may be caused in under normal conditions. That's whether it frequent operation or there be maintenance or some repair at these certain locations here. Now every process block, process block is going to can, contain electrical equipment, whether there be lights, motors, heaters. Now once we start implementing these unmanned aerial system for different applications, we introduce a, um, another source of ignition that can be added. Now during an abnormal condition, whether it be a gas leak or, a gas leak or a, a vapor release, and if this vapor is actually between those flammable ranges that we discussed, and if there happens to be an ignition source, whether it be from the lights, the motor, or the, or the drone, it can, can, can result into serious consequences like a fire or a, a catastrophic explosion. Now really, it only takes a small spark for an accident or a catastrophic event to occur. So that's why there's strict safety requirements imp implemented in hazardous environments and, and such like this. Now it's an important to operate safely and not to endanger the community or hurt people or damage or um, cause harm to the actual environment when we're working um, in the oil and gas industry. Now, in order to prevent and minimize the likability of an incident, the industry set requirements and standards for locations with significant hazards. Now I segue from the materials part and discuss a little bit about hazardous locations. This will be useful if you're trying to, trying to do a job at oil and gas industries or um, in the petrochemical industry. Now the definition of a hazardous location is a place where concentrations of flammable gases and vapors and dust occur. Now it is important to know the characteristics of these materials and their locations and their potential sources at these units to associate the hazards with each potential leak. Now once we classified the area, we take the National Electric Code Book, which provides a very specific requirement regarding the electrical equipment installed in these locations. These requirements are intended to prevent electrical equipment from being actual ignition sources within the oil and gas industries and hazardous locations. Now each refinery or petrochemical industry has an electrical area classification. This determines the existence and the extent of the hazard locations, locations in the facility handling insulation of electrical equipment to prevent ignitions, in, ignitions of flammable gases. So each drawing will have their classes, divisions, and groups, which I'll explain a little bit about in the next slides. Now class one denotes area where the flammable gases, vapors, and liquids are presented. These are examples of petrochemical industries, solvent plants, sewage treatment areas, recycling plants, and food processing plants. Your classes two denotes areas where combustible dust is actually present. This includes grain elevators, coal handling operation, and various type of processing operations. Your class three is gonna be ignitable fibers and flying fire hazards. This is a cotton textile operation would be a good example of these locations. Now, in addition to the classes, there is also the divisions that identifies the conditions of the actual hazard. Your potential source of ignitable gas exists during a normal condition due to frequent operation or maintenance or repair, these locations are considered to be division one. Now, if there's a hazard presented during an abnormal condition, like a vapor release or a gas leak, these are considered to be division two. So the next example identifies the difference between a division one and a division two. Division ones are identified in the slide with demonstration where there might be hazards during normal operation. Division twos are locations identified in an area where contain hazardous locations, but during abnormal conditions. So when you're operating in a plant like this, it kind of gives you an idea where you should be safely operating and what hazards are actually located within the oil and gas industry. Having this knowledge is useful to, to operate safely. Now furthermore, the, we, the NEC also classifies the groups and typical materials in detail, specifying what gases or what groups of materials it's located. 
Class A, or groups A, B, C, and D are all related to class one. Class E, F, G are all corresponding to class two, and there is no groups corresponding to class three. Now what I do is I switch gears and move away from hazardous materials and locations and begin to discuss my final safety concern, which is electromagnetic interference. Now these drones are considered to be small flying computers and problems with small flying computers or computers in general is electromagnetic interference. The electromagnetic interference is a disturbance of the effects of the electrical circuit due to either electromagnetic induction or radi radiation emitted from an external source. Now the oil and gas industry have various energies from high voltage equipment. EMI is caused by high voltage power lines, electric motors that can affect or interfere with unmanned, electrical, unmanned aircraft electronics and components and radio control. I believe there should be design requirements set to mitigate this and not affect the actual systems or for it to malfunction. Furthermore, I believe that there should be specific radio controls that should be set because there could be interference within the radio control and the, um, the aircraft and the operator. Now before I conclude, I ask these questions. What safety standards and procedures should we implement to ensure safe operation in hazardous locations? What design requirements should be applied to avoid any potential source or radio electromagnetic interference with the system components and communication to prevent any collisions or malfunctions? And then finally, what maintenance and training programs should be developed to ensure drone operators are educated and trained to identify any potential risks in the oil and gas industry? Now, even though I scratched the surface of um, the safety consideration of oil and gas, we develop kind of a, um, our own safety practice so we can continue. We talked about, or we discussed a little bit about pre-flight plan which allow us to detail job, create a plan, pull up electrical area classification drawings. And we also write up a drone hazard analysis which identifies specific hazards located in the oil and gas industry. And we determine weather conditions, safety landing, um, emergency exits. And then we also try to do a post-flight analysis which is a data collection. We start recording, documenting, um, and keeping records of maintenance logs and documenting findings and lesson learns from our operations. Now there could be many applications that are used, but um, I feel like this is kind of the beginning. I hope to present a actual paper in the IEEE um, Industrial Application Society Petrochemical Industry uh, in 2016. And my vision is to provide aerial service and engineering and help various um, industries create drone safety programs and kind of come up with solutions. But otherwise, I put my name on there and my contact information if anyone has any questions. My email is danny.cepeda at rotoroptics.com. And feel free to introduce yourself if you have any questions afterwards. This concludes my presentation. Thank you.